Welcome back. Cuts to education funding from two years ago continue to play a major role in the political debates at the Capitol today. So how should Texas pay for schooling? Joining me now is Texas Commissioner of Education, Michael Williams. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. So you've been talking to legislators, uh, te testifying before committees uh, this session so far. What are you telling superintendents when it comes to um, the possibility of maybe restoring those funds, maybe not? Are you saying this is the new normal? Well, what I'm really telling you is, number one, let's remind everyone, I'm the defendant in that particular case. And, and the court, while he, the judge has given us his uh, ruling from the bench, we have not seen the written ruling from him yet. And what I'm really telling superintendents is that there's going to be a robust conversation among the legislators about funding for schools. But it just seems to me that the more prudent time for us to make those large funding determinations is after the Supreme Court has given us the final ruling in this case. So charter schools is another area that they've been talking about so far this session. Um, there's been talk of raising the cap on the number of charter schools, but I'm wondering how, even if we raise the cap, do you filter out those bad charter schools? Well, I think that those are two different, two different tracks. There's no doubt that charter schools have brought us a great deal of innovation and creativity, and many of those charter schools are doing an outstanding job of educating youngsters, even youngsters that are, that are hard to teach. But there's also no doubt that we also have some failing and underperforming charter schools. And in the Sunset Commission report for TEA has given the commissioner more power, more authority, and even more encouragement to close down failing and, and, and poor performing charter schools. When we have the charter conversation, you know, I can't help but think about Eastside Memorial here in the uh, Austin Independent School District. What is going on over there? Well, I think that's something that right now that is a question that's better directed towards AISD. AISD obviously had as part of its reconstitution agreement with my predecessor uh, an agreement to use charter schools as a way of providing learning to those youngsters. It appears that it is the, the position of at least a majority of those school board members to go in a different direction. And I look forward to, to the, what, what they come up with and what the plan they come up with uh, for the educating those youngsters going into next year. But I look forward to hearing about it right after school ends. Are there any options there that you absolutely do not like? Well, I think it would be premature for me to say right now and, and to make a judgment on what they may or may not do. But it's extremely important that I see a, a plan that will provide at least as good of learning as what I think could have been provided by the Idea Charter School. When we talk about underperforming schools, you made the announcement this week about, uh, I guess, closing or consolidating the North Forest ISD in the Houston area into Houston ISD. Oh. Are we going to start seeing more big changes like that now that you're in this well, office? Josh, I would hope, I hope we don't see uh, many districts that have uh, been chronically un underperforming for maybe two or more decades. North Forest is a unique, unfortunately it is a unique circumstance. And I would hope not to see more, more of the same. But I think it's also extremely important. We in this state have an obligation to make sure we provide a quality education to every youngster in every classroom, in every school, in every district across this state. And to the extent that local officials are unable to provide that kind of high quality learning, then we at the Texas Education Agency will utilize the resources and the powers and authority the legislature has given me. When it comes to, you know, putting that equation into play, how do you feel like whatever lawmakers decide with accountability and testing standards this session will make those decisions for you? Well, obviously, well, we implement what the legislature does. But I think as part of this conversation, it's important to sort of decouple two of the important features. Let's decouple the notion about what it is, what's the body of, of knowledge that we want youngsters to master by the time he or she graduates and gets that diploma on Saturday and either go to college or work or to the military on Monday. And decouple that from the notion of how many tests a youngster has to take. It's extremely important for us as a state not to back away from what the high expectations that we've held for students for since 1994 at least because the level of expectation dictates the level of results that we're going to get from our youngsters so let's not pull away from that there's going to be a conversation about whether 15 tests is too many and maybe it ought to be eight or nine or ten or some folks may think it ought to be less than that but those are not the same conversations so let's but let's not back away and retreat at all from the body of knowledge i believe youngsters need four years of of, of rigor in English language arts and four years of rigor in math and four years of rigor in science. They need to know 
about American history and, and the world's geography and, and, and world history. Let's not pull away from that. Right, Commissioner, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. All right, coming up, our roundtable keeps diving into the education topic as In Session In-Depth returns.